In April 2025, 19 vehicles rolled out of a brand new factory in Indiana. They were heading straight into 18 months of military testing. Cutting-edge tactical trucks designed to mount counter-drone systems that could hunt swarms while hauling troops through hostile territory. One month later, the Army canceled the program. Not suspended, not delayed, canceled. Here's what makes this wild. These weren't experimental prototypes. The JLTV A2 represented over 250 engineering improvements specifically designed to solve problems the Army had been screaming about for years. Corrosion eating through chassis, power systems maxed out by modern electronics, maintenance so complex you needed factory reps for basic service. AM General fixed all of it, built a 96-acre smart factory, delivered the first test vehicles on schedule, and then Defense Secretary Pete Hegseth sent a memo calling ground vehicles like the JLTV outdated and excess equipment. But here's the twist that makes this story matter. The Marine Corps is doubling down. They're keeping the program alive because unlike the Army, the Marines actually need what the JLTV A2 offers. The Army knows if you can't defend a convoy from drones, you can't move. The Marines are betting everything on mobile CUAS, traditional air defense missiles, stingers at $120,000 to $150,000 each work, but you burn through your budget fast using precision missiles against cheap consumer drones. So why did the Army walk away from the platform built to solve this problem? By the end, you'll understand what just happened and why it matters for the future of ground warfare. Let's rewind to 2022 when this story actually starts. The Army wanted to recompete the JLTV contract. Oshkosh Defense had been building them since 2015. Solid trucks, combat proven, widely deployed, but Congress mandated competition to drive down costs and encourage innovation. AM General One, the same company that built the original Humvee would now produce the next generation. Except they didn't just want to build Oshkosh's design cheaper, they wanted to fix fundamental problems. Problem one, corrosion. Marines were finding structural cracks in JLTVs after just a few years of service. Salt water, road chemicals, operational tempo, vehicles degrading faster than predicted, critical stress fractures appearing where they shouldn't exist. Problem two, maintenance nightmare. Young soldiers couldn't perform basic upkeep without civilian contractors. The A1's packaging was so dense, so tightly engineered for maximum capability that accessing components meant disassembling half the vehicle. Problem three, electrical capacity. The A1 generated 12.8 to 14.6 kilowatts, fine for 2015, completely inadequate for 2025. When you're trying to run modern radios, electronic warfare gear, active protection systems, and counter UAS equipment simultaneously, some units literally towed generators behind JLTVs because onboard power couldn't handle mission loads. AM General addressed all three. Enhanced corrosion protection exceeding 30-year resistance standards. Redesigned internal layout for tool-free maintenance access. Revolutionary 24-volt lithium-ion power architecture replacing dual lead-acid batteries. Not just lighter, but enabling future hybrid systems and providing the electrical foundation for CUAS integration. They incorporated over 250 engineering modifications. Built the A2 specifically to carry the sensors, effectors, and power systems needed for drone defense. The Marines had been proving the concept since 2019 with Mattis, Marine Air Defense Integrated System, two JLTVs working in pairs to detect, track, and kill drones. The A2 would make that capability sustainable at scale. In February 2023, AM General won an $8.66 billion contract for up to 20,682 vehicles. They built a state-of-the-art factory from the ground up. In April 2025, they delivered the first A2s for testing. On May 1, 2025, the Army published a memo, no more JLTV purchases, ever. The 250 vehicles delivered in January would be the last Army order. The mystery isn't just why the Army canceled, it's what happens now that only the Marines are buying. To understand what just happened, you need the full timeline. The JLTV program launched in 2006, born from Iraq's brutal IED lessons. Humvees were getting shredded. Initial response, bolt-on armor. But Humvee chassis weren't designed for that weight. Mobility tanked, reliability collapsed. Soldiers died in vehicles too heavy to maneuver out of danger. Pentagon requirements, mine-resistant protection with Humvee mobility. Helicopter transportable, blast survivable. Go anywhere the Humvee went, but bring troops home alive. Oshkosh won in 2015. Over the next eight years, they delivered roughly 20,000 vehicles to Army and Marines. The platform worked, 
Cruise praised its off-road performance, blast protection, and durability. But the battlefield was changing again. While JLTV was being optimized for IEDs buried in roads, adversaries were developing threats from above. Commercial drone tech exploded. China, Russia, Iran, all fielding or proliferating small UAS. Non-state actors using modified consumer quadcopters for reconnaissance and attack. By 2024, the Joint Counter UAS office was running swarm demonstrations at Yuma, 40 plus drones converging simultaneously. The conclusion, no single system works. You need layered defense, detection, tracking, identification, kinetic and non-kinetic defeat, all integrated through command and control. None of that's possible without serious onboard power. The Marines figured this out first. They've been running Mattis on JLTV platforms since 2019. Two vehicle teams with Mark 1, kinetic 30 mm cannon, stingers, EW, and Mark 2, sensors, radar, RF detection, C2. It works. They're committed. Planning 190 Mattis systems plus 21 lightweight variants. The A2 would have made this easier. Better power management, simpler maintenance, enhanced reliability, the electrical architecture to support everything from proximity-fused ammunition to directed energy weapons. Then Secretary Hegseth's Army Transformation Initiative hit. The stated rationale, pivot to Indo-Pacific, maritime focus, less need for ground vehicles. Army Vice Chief General James Mingus told reporters in May 2025, we have enough JLTVs, we've bought enough already. Inside armor, heavy and striker formations, we have enough. Translation, the Army's heavy formations are already equipped. Light formations are going to use infantry squad vehicles. Smaller, faster, cheaper. The Marines, different calculation. Commandant General Eric Smith testified before Congress, the JLTV is our workhorse ground tactical vehicle fleet. We're fully committed because the Marines need Mattis. They need rogue fires. They need mobile platforms that can defend themselves while maneuvering in contested littoral environments. Let's examine what the A2 actually delivers because understanding the platform explains why this cancellation matters. Foundation, 2024, Duramax 6.6 liter turbo diesel, 470 horsepower, 975 pound-feet torque, 15% more fuel efficient than the A1 through transmission optimization. Allison 2500 SP6 speed with generation six control module. The game changer, single 24 volt lithium ion battery, not two lead acid packs, one advanced lithium system, lighter, higher energy density, enables future hybridization. The electrical architecture was rebuilt around this battery with a smart power distribution unit actively managing loads. The upgraded alternator isn't just bigger, it's engineered for lithium ion integration. Communications features allow real-time battery monitoring and intelligent load management. If battery charge drops below threshold, the engine automatically fires to recharge. Silent watch capability for limited periods, running sensors and comms without constant fuel burn. Why this matters for CUAS, you now have a platform supporting multiple simultaneous power profiles, vehicle systems, communications, sensor packages, effector systems, all dynamically managed. The Marines proved it works. Mattis on legacy A1 platforms, constantly juggling power constraints. Mark 1 carries the Kongsberg RS-6 remote weapon station with XM 914-30mm chain gun, Stinger missiles, electronic warfare. Mark II is the Sensor C2 node, ground surveillance radar, RF jammers, EW suite. These trucks hunt drones, operationally deployed since 2019, built on platforms with electrical systems that weren't designed for this mission. Now imagine that capability on the A2 architecture. Leonardo DRS demonstrated the potential at AUSA 2024 with their Air Defense Light variant. JLTV with RPS-42 radar, EOS R-400, Slinger 30mm remote weapon station, APKWS laser-guided rockets, Stinger quad launchers. That's layered kinetic defense. For non-kinetic, Blue Halo's Locust integration changes everything. Their 26-kilowatt laser weapon system has over 10,000 operational combat hours. September 2024 demonstrations in Socorro, New Mexico destroyed every drone presented over two days. Groups one through three UAS, from small quadcopters to larger fixed-wing platforms. The real breakthrough, 30 millimeter airburst ammunition with proximity fuses. Northrop Grumman's XM-1211, high explosive proximity round, uses miniaturized RF sensor technology, capability that previously only existed in artillery shells and missiles. 
When the round detects, it's within optimal lethal radius of a target. It detonates. No direct hit required. A two to three round burst gives high kill probability against class one and two drones. Cost comparison matters. A Stinger missile, $120,000 to $150,000. A Coyote interceptor, around $100,000. 130 millimeter proximity round. Dramatically cheaper, reports suggest well under $10,000 per shot. Though exact pricing remains classified, you can engage dozens of drone threats for the cost of a single traditional missile. The Army's developing the XM-1223 multi-mode proximity airburst, programmable fusing switching between proximity airburst for drones, proximity delay for troops in defilade, and point detonation for light armor. One munition, three threat profiles, programmed through contact fuse setter integrated into the weapon station. This is the layered capability model, detection and tracking through radar and EOIR, electronic warfare for soft kill, kinetic defeat through guns and missiles, directed energy for cost-effective hard kill against swarms. The A2 platform enables all of this simultaneously because it solved the power and integration challenges from the ground up. So why did the Army walk away from it? Here's what the cancellation actually means. For the Marines, they're committed but facing higher costs. Commandant Smith testified that per unit prices are clearly going to go up when Army orders disappear. Economies of scale matter. Fewer total vehicles means higher unit costs means budget pressure. But the Marines need this capability. Mattis is central to Force Design 2030. Rogue Fires, their remotely operated ground vehicle for anti-ship missiles, uses the JLTV chassis. They've procured about half their planned 15,000 total buy. They're not stopping now. For AM General, backlog through 2027. They'll fulfill existing contracts, marine orders, foreign military sales, the factory runs, but the $8.66 billion army contract, dead. The volume that justified building a 96 acre smart facility, gone for the army. This is a strategic bet. General Mingus said they have enough JLTVs for heavy and striker formations. Light formations get infantry squad vehicles, smaller, faster, cheaper platforms that won't survive the same threat environment, but offer different tactical advantages. The unspoken calculation, Indo-Pacific focus means maritime operations, long range fires, air and naval power. Ground vehicle convoys matter less when you're island hopping across the Pacific rather than sustaining land campaigns in the Middle East. But here's the problem that doesn't go away. Drones. Ukraine showed what happens when you don't solve counter UAS. Every convoy becomes a target. Every static position gets mapped by reconnaissance drones and hit by one-way attacks. The threat environment doesn't care about your strategic pivot. The Marines understand this. They're betting on mobile CUAS because they know they'll operate in contested littoral environments where air superiority isn't guaranteed and threats come from all vectors. Six countries are pursuing foreign military sales. Canada approved $220 million for JLTV A2s. NATO allies watching closely because the drone threat is universal. The irony, the Army canceled a platform specifically designed to address the signature threat of modern warfare at the exact moment when that threat is intensifying globally. China's watching, Russia's adapting, Iran's proliferating drone technology to proxies worldwide, and the U.S. Army just decided it has enough vehicles capable of defending against those threats. So where does this leave us? Short term, those 19 JLTV A2 test vehicles delivered in April 2025 will complete their 18-month evaluation at Aberdeen and Yuma. The Army will collect data on 250 engineering improvements they'll never buy at scale. Testing continues because contracts were signed but there's no production future for the Army. Marine Corps production, they'll buy what they can afford at higher unit costs. AM General will continue manufacturing. The question is sustainability. Can the production line support just Marine Corps and FMS orders? Can suppliers maintain capacity without Army volume? The testing data won't be wasted. Those corrosion improvements, maintenance enhancements, power system upgrades, they'll inform future tactical vehicle programs when the Army eventually needs to replace its existing JLTV fleet, those lessons remain valuable. CUAS technology development continues regardless. The 30 mm proximity ammunition, directed energy systems, electronic warfare packages, these aren't JLTV exclusive. They'll migrate to other platforms, strikers, infantry squad vehicles, whatever comes next. High power microwave systems, AI enabled targeting, hybrid electric variants, all this keeps advancing. The XM-1223 MMPA round moves toward production. 
Blue Halo's Locus gets integrated on multiple platforms. The technology doesn't die with the program, but there's a question nobody's answered. What happens in five years when the Army's existing JLTVs need replacement? When corrosion catches up? When maintenance backlogs mount? When the electrical systems can't support next generation requirements? The infantry squad vehicle is lighter, faster, cheaper. It's also less protected, less capable, can't carry the same CUAS systems, won't survive the same threat environment. The Army's betting that future conflicts won't require these capabilities at scale, that precision fires and air superiority obviate the need for protected mobile formations, that the Indo-Pacific fight looks fundamentally different from Middle Eastern counterinsurgency. They might be right, but if they're wrong, if ground forces need to maneuver through drone-saturated environments, the Marines will have the trucks that can do it, and the Army will be buying Humvees. The Army just canceled a program specifically designed for the modern threat environment. Do you think this was the right call? Strategic pivot or strategic mistake? Drop your analysis in comments with reasoning. See you next time.